So I met Schmidt in 84, and we were this giant company. I mean, we were a conglomerate. We, we had two railroads, one in trust. We had a trucking company. We had four different pipelines. As I said, we had a very important one that moving uh, refined products into Arizona. We had a coal slurry pipeline, the only profitable one in the world. Uh, we had a, uh, 540,000 uh, acres of timber in Northern California. We had a million acres of timber in Texas and Louisiana. We were one of the largest producers of plywood in the country. Um, we had the Santa Fe Energy, which had a whole bunch of oil uh, down in Southern California. It was the 10th largest producer or independent producer of uh, petroleum in the United States. We had a construction company. We had the company that managed Los Alamos, which was the uh, place where they invented the atomic bomb. We had uh, a um, a fledging mining company that was making uh, coal and or producing coal in New Mexico, and we were starting a, a gold mine in uh, Northern California. All that under one roof, and the stock was trading at about twenty-four bucks a share. And if you took all the assets and separated them out, it was probably worth sixty-five. And right on top of that, we were going through this process trying to get the railroad merger approved, and Schmidt made a bunch of really stupid mistakes that. Uh, really upset the ICC. He started painting the new, the color for the new locomotives, and, and merger wasn't even approved. And uh, he what started was that saying the the initial stood for shouldn't paint so fast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I never heard that, yeah. but that, but that's pretty good. So uh, what happened was the and 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 Schmidt was the kind of guy that he had to do everything. He had to approve everything, and he never left the office uh, on Michigan Avenue. So here are all these conglomerates. And the guy who's running the real estate wants to build a $20 million tilt-up warehouse in uh, Southern California, got a rate of return, 15 16%, a slam dunk. They have to write it up. They give it to me because for a while, after a while, I, I was supposed to be in charge of a bunch of the different subsidiaries, and I would take it into Schmidt, and Schmidt, because he didn't want to make a decision, would red ink all over it. And I'd turn it right around in 24 hours and ship it right back into him. And eventually we'd have to approve it. And one time I said to him, I walked in there and I said, you know, John, all these subsidiaries that we have, you know who their biggest enemy is? He said, no, who? He said, we. He said, are you accusing me of being the biggest enemy? And I said, I didn't say you, I said we. This holding company is holding these companies back from doing what they should be doing. And you've got good managers who know how to do it and they just want to do it. Well, that was kind of the end with me and Schmidt. Um, in the meantime, so that's when I went out and started just getting to know all the companies. And, and then the ICC, lo and behold, we were at a board meeting. Let's see, that was on July 23rd, 1986. So we're, we're in the board meeting and there were 30 people on the, uh, on the SFSP board because neither former company had the guts to help fire anybody when we had the merger. Plus Schwartz and uh, Firth and me were board members as well. So I mean, we had 30 people. It was like addressing the United Nations when you, when you <laughs> we had this giant board table and it wasn't big enough. But anyway, so Schmidt's sitting there at the end of the board and he says, I'm gonna go get on the corporate jet. I'm going to fly to uh, Washington, D.C. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to the Interstate Commerce Commission building. I'm going to go to hearing room B. I'm going to sit in the first row, and I'm going to watch the Interstate Commerce Commission approve the merger five to nothing with no conditions. We, you know, people looked around, and he got most of it right. He, he got to Washington, got the right city, he got the right building, got on the right he plane. got the right room, <laughs> and he turned them down cold one to four. <laughs> oh, oh my God. And I was, uh, I, I was out at the pipeline headquarters in Los Angeles, and I get in the elevator to meet with a, uh, go to a meeting of the pipeline management, and Ray Hunt, who was the uh, CEO of the pipeline, said, did you hear the word? I said, what happened? ICC turned down the merger. Well, that was kind of the beginning of the end for Schmidt. He'd had a lot of problems with the board. He was a, a really paranoid guy. He tried to fire Miller, Biagini, and Bill Haynes, who had been the uh, CEO of Chevron, uh, because um, he made he cooked up something about they had a conflict and they got their own lawyer and beat him down. So uh, 
Schmidt tried to make a deal uh, to parcel out trackage rights and everything and get rid of the anti-competitive situation and uh, and then go back to the ICC and they turned him down again one to four. Actually, he was gone by the time they voted, but he got turned down one to four. So on April 17th in 1987, the board convened a special meeting. And we, we knew, I just knew from Biagini, because Schwartz and Schmidt, uh, uh, Schwartz, and Firth and I went around and talked to you know, some of the directors and because we heard the idea about we're going to fire, you know, we, we want to fire Schmidt. And uh, we said, you know, don't do that. We can make some changes. We can do delegation. And so we had this special board meeting. It was on Good Friday. And uh, each one of us, it was, a, it was an executive board meeting, so there was no, you know, no staff, but, but Schwartz, and Firth and I got called in one at a time to, you know, to answer questions. And uh, we all said the same thing. You know, we can make this work. And about four o'clock, the board meeting is over. Everybody's running out to catch their flights back to wherever they're going. And I walk into Schmidt's office. The man has no job. And uh, the, uh, the way it came out and the way it should it, it, it should be it, it should be uh, recognized as Schmidt saying, "I'm I'm stepping down. I have other things that I want to do," and uh, that's the way it was announced. That's the way you know. That's the way I I believe it. I you know. Uh, so anyway, he's gone, and they make Reed the uh, acting CEO, and then start a search. So he'd been retired for a little while. Yeah, he'd been retired. Uh, well, let's see. The merger was in '83. This was in '86. He was probably retired in '80, somewhere around that. Because Schmidt had been CEO for a few years before we made the merger. So that's quite a comeback from you know being retired for five or six years. To yeah, and he's a good guy, and and we, and we had this great big question mark. What the heck are we going to do? In the meantime, uh, the Henley Group. Uh, had started buying our, our uh, stock. Um, Michael Dingman was this guy. Allied and Signal merged. And the guy who was running the company wanted to get rid of Dingman. I, he had been the CEO of one of the two companies. And so he gave him a bunch of little subsidiaries. They called them Dingman's dogs. And they spun him off. And he called it the Henley Group because he was a great fan of rowing. And there's this big regatta in Henley or something in England. Okay. So, so the first thing that Dingman does, he's, 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 this guy's a deal maker. And uh, he looked at Santa Fe, Southern Pacific Santa Fe, and he saw that all these assets and the stock's trading at 24. So he started buying it. And uh, he actually had some conversation, uh, I guess, with, um, with Schmidt. And then he went to see Reed when Reed was CEO and said, I'd like to buy the company. And Reed said, well, you know, thank you, but it's not really for sale. Um, so then on Black Monday, October 19th, 1987, the market went down. S SP, the market went down 400 points or something. SPSF went down 35%. And Henley Group bought all the shares it could. The next thing we wake up, and they own fourteen percent of the company. And we had we had a poison pill. So if they got too far, then uh, they would have been diluted by the stockholders all getting to buy stock at half price, except for Henley. And uh, well, but I thought to myself, okay, I'm. Uh, I don't know if I'd been main CEO at that time or not. I probably was. And I thought, I mean, I'm working for the stockholders. And if we can get 63 or 64 bucks a share for the company, we ought to sell it to somebody. It's just that simple. So I worked with, uh, with Goldman Sachs. Hank Paulson was the oh, really? Chicago rep at the time. <laughs> and we were, we were good, good friends. And, and I had a lot of confidence in him. And we put together a 24 page um submission for him to give him to buy the company at 63 bucks a share 10 billion dollars and he um he was flabbergasted 
I wasn't there, but we had Goldman Sachs presented. I was at the symphony in, uh, in, in Chicago when I went out and found out what happened, uh, you know, how, how it all went. And uh, he said, I'm just really surprised you do this. I think, I think this is something that we can make work. And uh, he had a credit line, 6.6 .6 billion. I think uh, Citibank was, uh, was probably the lead. But then he thought, well, I don't want to take on a lot more debt, so I want to do a part stock transaction. So he came to see me and um, we negotiated a deal where we valued the, uh, the Henley Group stock at 20 bucks a share. So they, they wanted 25, uh, but that meant we got more shares. Our shareholders got the cash and then more shares and we shook hands on the deal. And the next morning he calls me and he says, Rob, there's a shitty part to every deal, is the exact words. And the shitty part to this deal is I can't do what I just told you because he went back and told his people, I'm going to let him, I'm going to do this deal and have a uh, back end exchange valuing us at 20 bucks a share. And I said, you can't, you can't do that. And so he reneged. So that's when we started a fight to control um, SFSP. And he was going to wage a proxy battle. About that time, uh, Olympia and York, a company based in Toronto, big in the real estate business, they also own Gulf Oil of Canada. They got interested in all of these non-railroad assets. And uh, so I got a call from Mickey Cantor, who had been the finance minister of Canada, and then they hired uh, him, Olympia, Olympia and York did, saying, we're interested in uh, SFSB. And I said, oh, sure. So they bought some shares and but together, the two of them, if they colluded, would have gone over the 15% limit where all our shareholders would have bought stock at bargain, ba bargain basement prices. And they couldn't do that. Henley sued for, to get rid of our poison pill and he lost. And they got a call from Mickey Cohen and said, you know, we, we just want to, we, we like what you're doing. We want to be a passive investor. And, um, we, we just want to uh, work with the company and we want to buy up to 15%. So we gave him two seats on the board and that was the end of Henley. Did you have outside advisors, investment bankers advising you on all of these complex, potentially complex transactions? Yeah, I sure did. And see, the other thing that was going on at this time, I guess I, I skipped a few things here, but at this time, we, when we couldn't do the deal with Henley, I called George Roberts at KKR, because I'd met him in San Francisco. And I said, you want to take a look at buying our company? And he sent a bunch of people out and they looked and they said, yeah, we can give you $52 a share. Well, I knew it was worth more than that. Um, and I said, no, we don't want to do that. So I finally, I said, well, why to myself? Why don't we just do to ourselves what somebody else is going to do? And all the benefit goes to our shareholders instead of these private equity guys or somebody who was taking money away from the people who really should have it. And uh, so we did. We announced a restructuring. We, we, were, we, we gave our shareholders a $4.2 billion dividend. We borrowed $3.6 billion to pay that dividend. We gave, uh, we put a Part of the deal we gave him was a $30 a share dividend was a pay in kind debenture, a pick debenture, 11% interest. And you didn't pay the dividend or the interest in cash. You just added it on to the principal and it was like a time bomb. So we did all that and we sold off all a bunch of companies. We, uh, um, and we got rid of that debt in four years, I think in about 24 months, four years early. And uh, there was one time when we were close to missing a $400 million principal payment and we made it. But in the meantime, so Henley had to do something and he wanted to get out. And uh, a guy by the name of Sam Zell, better known as the, the grave digger, <laughs> grave robber, I guess, uh, owned a car leasing company, railroad car leasing company, and so did Henley. And so Zell took, he wanted that car leasing company and, and, and uh, Dingham and got him to take the Santa Fe stock as well. 
uh, because there was some way a tax advantage for him to make this part of this transaction. And so I get this call one day from Sam Zell, who I knew because he was interested in, in buying the SP when we were trying to sell the SP. And he, uh, so I was familiar with him. And he um, answered the phone and said, Krebs. He said, Rob. And I said, hey, Sam, what's up? He said, Sam, guess what? What, Sam? I just bought 15% of your company. <laughs> so he comes over on his motorcycle and, <laughs> and tells me how much he loves the Santa Fe and how great this is going to be. Oh, my God. So now I had... Uh, I had Zell and Reichman, and we gave them both two seats on the board. So, so almost 40% of the stockholders were represented on the board because they both owned about 20% of the company. And that's when we went through and finished the restructuring. We spun off the real estate. Zell knew the guys at CalPERS, you know, the great big pension uh, fund in California. He got them to pay 35 bucks a share for the uh, real estate company. And then we spun off the 80% tax rate to our shareholders. That stock over time went down to 13. Uh, we bought, uh, we, we took the uh, oil company public at, at 18 bucks a share, spun off the rest to our shareholders, and it went down to eight. Um, and the railroad, when we were all, when, when the dust settled, we did a, a uh, MLP of the, uh, the big refined products pipeline when, when the whole thing, when the dust settled, all that left was left was a poor little Santa Fe Railroad and a fledging mining company that we eventually built into the fifth largest gold producer in North America. But it was too small at the time to spin off. And you could have bought the, uh, the, uh, the stock in the company at five bucks a share. And it went up 50% compounded annually for six years while all these great natural resources that Zell and Reichman and Dingman and everybody wanted went the other way. Went like that. Oh, and the other thing we did, we sold the SP. Part of the way we paid off our debt was to sell the SP to Phil Anschutz. And that was a story in itself because Reed and I went around and used the company jet before I sold it. And we called, called all the CEOs of the big railroad saying, would you like to buy one of our railroads? And none of them wanted to. So we said, okay, well, we just got to put it out for auction. No, nope, not even a nibble. Not even a nibble. We, we talked to uh, Drew Lewis, who had just taken over UP. We talked to uh, Arnold McKinnon at Norfolk. We talked to uh, John, um, come on, he, went, he became Secretary of the Treasury. Snow. Snow uh, at the CSX. Um, nobody wanted it. So we also knew that. I knew that the, the better of the two railroads was the Santa Fe by far. I, I never said this when I talked about showing up at the Santa Fe, but it just ran like a clock, like clock, day after day after day, uh, as opposed to the FC, SP, which was, you know, what, what calamity are we going to deal with this morning? <laughs> uh, so, so we put the SP out for, uh, for bid, and we had three, I said, legitimate buyers. Casey had a billion dollars. Uh, Mellon at a billion, but I didn't know where he was going to get the cash. And Phil Anschutz, it's Tim, Tim Mellon, yeah, yeah. and 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 uh, and Anschutz, who had purchased the DNRG and made a killing. I mean, he, he bought the D, DNRG and basically paid for it with the cash they had in their bank account. And he had this guy Holtman running it, who had run the DNRG. You know, and before he bought it, he, he just left Holtman there. Holtman was a good guy, so Anschutz. You know, he tells Holtman, I think you know, I'd like to buy the SP. And Holtman says to him, well, would you rather have a little railroad that makes a lot of money or a big railroad that loses a lot of money? And then she says, well, I think I'll take the big railroad. So he offered $625 million. And uh, everything was set up for us to accept the KCS offer because I knew they could get it approved. And I also knew they had the money. And they had hired Dick Spence as their, uh, their uh, coordinator or advisor and I'm sitting in my office down the railway exchange building on a Sunday with a pile of papers like that, just trying to get through them. And the phone rings and it's Anschutz. And I pick it up and he says, Rob, you got to sell me the uh, Southern Pacific Railroad. I said, why, Phil? He said, because I can get it approved. 
I said, well, Phil, the KCS can get it approved. You know, there's only one thing that is going to, that's going to get the, the SP railroad, and that is cold, hard cash. And I hang up the phone. And the next morning, that was on a Sunday, the next morning, Anschutz bid a billion, 25 million. And so we sold it to Anschutz. So that's how all that stuff kind of went away and there we were sitting there as the Santa Fe Railroad. And then that was the big push. And, and I'll tell you, people were scared to death. Many uh, people thought the Santa Fe Railroad couldn't exist without all these other uh, assets. And uh, we started to whittle it down. Um, I didn't ask, I just gave every, every man, every person on the staff, somewhere between a 25 and a 4% wage cut. I was the only one that took 25. My admin took, she took 4%, but we also gave them stock options. Every staff person on the railroad, every management person had stock options and a bonus plan based on safety, service, and profitability. And they all made back much more than they would have if they just had their same old salaries. And the locomotive Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers was so skeptical about the railroad's future and so scared that they actually agreed to a five-year deal with no wage increases except if there was inflation and they were on the same bonus plan we were and so that's that we started the beginning of then building the santa fe i think what's interesting is you ended up at a job in san francisco which was sort of a nothing job, purgatory, you described it as. You end up in the Santa Fe in Chicago and you're not running the railroad. You end up with this sort of amorphous, nondescript job of trying to make sense out of the subsidiaries. But in each case, you managed to make something of the job. I mean, there's some people who would have just sat there and said, okay, I'll wait for somebody to tell me what to do. And if they don't, I'm just going to hang around and collect my check. And you seem to be able to create opportunities out of whole cloth and make make something out of it that was both good for the company and for you professionally in terms of development. Yeah, I, uh, I, you know, it wasn't wasted time because in both cases I got to know the company and I got to find out things that I, that, that were very helpful to me, yeah. helpful to me later. The, the Santa Fe, I was amazed at the Santa Fe. The Santa Fe was so politically uh, oriented. I mean, it's just who you know. And Schmidt had this little coterie of people that, that were all lawyers and, the um, and, and uh, it was just just a constant battle. You know who 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 does he like? Who you know, who who's this? And 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 some of the departments were very were very barely functioning. I mean, the law department. If you wanted to head talk to the head of the uh, of the railroad law department, you better get him before lunch, because they all went down to the. Uh, uh, the Illinois Athletic Club, Chicago Athletic Club, which was about two blocks down the street on Michigan Avenue, and they'd sit there and drink martinis at lunch, you know, in a the good old days. that has rule G, and yeah. you're not supposed to even drink. I, t I, I put a stop to all that. Uh, yeah, it was just so politically motivated. So it wasn't tired from working out at the gym down there. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, uh, the, the trial. Uh, Etsy? Yeah, that's a, an interesting saga on its own. Yeah, we had two things that uh, that were really killers. So I told you that Schmidt wanted to get rid of Bechtel and Haynes. Um, Steve Bechtel was the chairman of this big Bechtel Corporation. In San and Francisco, he, right? Yeah, and Haynes was on his board. Uh, and Etsy was this pipeline a coal slurry pipeline that was supposed to be built from the Powder River Basin down to Houston and other parts in the southeastern part of the United States to deliver coal, coal slurry. And uh, of course, that was not a really happy thing for railroads because we were moving all the coal. Well, we had the right, uh, they didn't, I don't know how it worked out, whether they had the right of eminent domain or not, because they had to cross it over our tracks or under our tracks in order to get down to Houston. I guess they finally battled that out and they won that. But in the meantime, they never really had a customer. They never could get the water. There were so many environmentalists that were opposed to it. It turned out what the best thing they had was a lawsuit saying that the railroad coll railroads colluded to keep them from, 
from building this pipeline. And they sued everybody but the Santa Fe. The Santa Fe was pretty much an innocent bystander. And by the, at that time, Bechtel and Haynes were on our board. Well, so it, Haynes tries to, or Schmidt tries to kick them off and they, they leave. And the next thing we know, <laughs> we, we were added to the uh, lawsuit. And uh, I went through all the stuff. This is about the time I was becoming CEO. I went through all the stuff. They had one little letter from, from Reed to somebody. It wasn't really a smoking gun. It didn't seem to me. And I, you know, all our lawyers were saying, oh, you know, we're not, we're not innocent. And we were strapped for cash. We had our $4.2 billion dividend and we were trying to pay down our debt. And uh, so we said, okay, we're going to, we'll go to trial if we have to. We could have got out probably for 25 million bucks if we were the first railroad. And I know the first one to do it was maybe the UP or I don't know who it was. But anyway, turned out everybody else settled for a grand total of 350 million bucks. And we're the ones going to trial in Beaumont, Texas. And, uh, and you know, there's a federal judge. I mean, this, is, this wasn't some you know, fly of the night you know, local court. This was a federal court. And I thought, OK, well, we're going to get a, a, fair, uh, fair, a fair chance here. And we hired this lawyer, Fred Firth who was a plaintiff's attorney from uh, San Francisco to take our case. And I went down there and, along with Jerry Donna, who was the head of our legal department, and we watched the trial. And we, ha we hired a shadow jury. Uh, they'd sit and listen, and then we'd go you know, hear what they had to say. And this guy Firth was just wowing everybody. He was just absolutely incredible. And uh, so Robert Parker, the judge, called us in. And uh, after the trial had gone on for, I don't know, maybe a month or so, and he says, you know what? You guys are just doing great here. And uh, this thing is going to be over next week. Um, we're going to have uh, our, probably our oral arguments next Monday and Tuesday. And the jury is going to take the case and it'll be over. So if I were you, I'd just, if you want to settle the thing, if I want to make an offer, I'd just do it over the weekend and then we'll see what happens. So he offered me eighty million bucks to settle. And uh, that just infuriated the judge. Why do you think? Well, because he was a good old boy down there with all the plaintiff's attorneys from Beaumont, even though he was a federal judge. And uh, so he issued a partially directed verdict, tossed it over the transfer that Monday morning, which basically he told the jury, well, Santa Fe is guilty. And uh, so you know, we, we just never could get, we couldn't get our arms around the impact that that had. Uh, and in the meantime, I had a board meeting out in L.A. And Zell really got incensed when we were talking about settling. And he, he got up and threw something down his napkin. That was a dinner meeting on the table and said, this is my money you're spending. And I'm not going to spend I'm not going to spend a, more, a penny more than one hundred and fifty million to settle this lawsuit. So we offered one hundred million, one hundred fifty million. And they came back with one hundred and sixty. And I, I took I took Zell's word for it. And first told me, don't. Don't settle, don't settle, we're gonna win this. Well, we, we lost, the verdict was 350 million and it was trebled. <laughs> because it was a uh, anti- Antitrust case. Antitrust, yeah. yeah. So that was like a billion dollars. So we, we also had another, loss, another, another lawsuit. This is when Schmidt was, was, I guess, before he was CEO, he made a deal with uh, Texas Utilities to lease them a whole bunch of coal in New Mexico. We had all these coal deposits. And they did a lease because I think it, 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 was, it was helpful to both companies for taxes. But this lease payment was a take or pay payment, and it was escalating up to as much as $72 million a year, whether they mined a lump of coal or not. And it turned out they didn't need the coal. And... Uh, and we were supposed to build a railroad up past where our existing coal mine was. And we never built the railroad because they never needed the coal. And they went to Schmidt, this guy, uh, Earl Nye, who was the CEO, went to Schmidt and said, you got to help me out here. I mean, I'm spending 50 million bucks a year now for nothing and it's going to get higher and I just can't do this. And Schmidt said, a deal is a deal and just write the checks. So they sued us and they said that the railroad and the holding company colluded to keep from allowing them to get to their coal. And after, after being burned once, you know, my lawyers came in and said, oh, you know, this is a slam dunk. There's not a chance in the world they're going to win this. So we hired a retired federal judge and we did a mock trial in, in Santa Fe. 
And we had, there were six jurors and six alternate jurors and both sides present, presented their case. And I walked out of there with Donna, who I remember saying, oh man, this, our guys are so good. They don't have a chance. The jurors came in the next day. There were 10 who said we were guilty and two who said we were innocent. <laughs> So, so that's what I said. We're, we're going to settle this case. We, I, we're just going to settle this case. So I sat down with Earl Nye, and he wrote us a check for a couple hundred million bucks, which we used to bargain down and pay the Etsy settlement. We got it down to three hundred and forty-three million, I think, and uh, and then they paid us seventeen million bucks a year, and we guaranteed them we build the railroad, and they never want the coal, and they never will want the coal, and so that was the end of that one. Did you build the railroad? No, we didn't yeah, have okay. to. Because they never told us they wanted the coal. And they, of course, now they'll never want the coal. Right. I mean, using coal, that's a bad deal, right? Yeah. Yeah. So those were those two cases. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about the management at, at SP I mean, between Swartz leaving and Haverty coming in? And Oh, at Santa Fe, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Cena was long gone, and, and uh, Schmidt made Schwartz the president of the railroad. Schwartz is a good guy. Didn't have much, he's another lawyer. He didn't have any railroad experience. He never left the building. Oh, he did a, a little bit, but he was smart enough to let people who knew the railroad run the railroad. And Harvey was the vice president of operations, and Harvey, I thought, was a good guy, too. People liked him. Uh, he... He, he worked his way up. He knew, knew the railroad. He had common sense. And so when Schwartz decided he wanted to retire and move to Santa Fe or someplace out there in, in the desert, um, my recommendation was we make Haverty president, which we did. And that was while all this restructuring was going on, and Zell was still an owner of the company. Uh, and, and Zell thought the railroad was worth next to nothing. He, he said we should get rid of the railroad, and we just didn't pay any attention to him. I guess we convinced him that we had all these other things we were doing, and they were coming out all right, and so we just let work on the railroad for a while. And uh, as we set about to to fix the Santa Fe, it was like it, we, it never had to go through what SP went through with the downsizing and cutting off of people and all that. But it was, it was ripe for that kind of activity because everything was always just so wonderful and nobody really worried too much about how much money it was making because it was making money. So I said to Howard, we got to start making cuts. You know, you didn't do much. So I just <coughs> called, called the closest superintendent in who was the, the guy who running the Chicago division. And I said, how many, how many people you got at Clover in the mechanical department? He said, I got 35. I said, great. Cut 15 of them. <laughs> <laughs> he's sitting down at the end of the table. He, after a while, he just got up and left. He, he couldn't take it. But that's what we did. We just worked through. And uh, I only cut off a couple thousand employees over a couple of years. In the meantime, Haverty, he, he just got the, he, he was kind of like Schmidt. He was a little paranoid too. But he got the, uh, the feeling that it was him or me. And he managed to make a big mistake. He wrote a letter to the board and said that. So he eventually he had to go. I tried to talk him out of it. He wouldn't. He wouldn't budge. That so, was in uh, ninety one, June of ninety one. So right. had you given thought to double track in the Transcon at that time? Because I yet. I just thought there's this great big main line that goes from Chicago to LA and it's just not a problem. It's everything as smooth as it can be. We can put all the trains out there we want. I forgot, oh, there's 670 million, or 670 miles of single track in the middle of that main line. <laughs> and, uh, and, and see, ha Haverty was a genius in one respect. He's the guy that got Hunt to come on the railroad. And he took, he took, uh, JB Hunt on a business car trip. Uh, from Chicago down to Kansas City, a big intermodal train with a with a hunt trailer right behind the business car, and uh, signed up this quantum thing, and and today the biggest customer on BNSF is BNSF is uh, Hunt, bigger than all the grain, bigger than all the coal, bigger than everything. Um, and it was a transformation for them now. Intermodal is a bigger part of their business than over the road trucking. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. 
So it's a contrast with Schneider, who, you know, Don Schneider was always, yep. I'm not interested in competing with myself on intermodal and that sort of thing. And he eventually finally came did. around. Yeah. And I knew him pretty well <clears> because <throat> he was from Green Bay and, you know, we spent a lot of time up there in Ephraim and, uh, and he was a nice guy, mm -hmm. yeah. a good guy. Well, can I take you back? Because okay. it's something I forgot to ask before, but when you were at Pine Bluff, um, you started your own diversity program, hiring black uh, switchmen and brakemen, um, as I understood it was a one for one. And that's 1973 or four or something like that. Yeah. Um, that was pretty avant-garde, particularly in that part of the world. How did that work? And how did the field react to that kind of thing? Well, I mean, I was a California person, right? There was no segregation in California. Yeah. And when I got to uh, the cotton mill, first thing I noticed, all these old broken down stations had separate bathrooms for black and white people. And we had only white people in train service. And uh, that's the beginning of equal opportunity. And the we did a lot of government work and, and the, the government was looking for us to make a change. And I, always, I felt like we should make a change. And um, so when we were wrapping up <coughs> this biggest bit business, we had to hire uh, a whole lot of uh, brakemen and switchmen. And I told uh, the uh, assistant superintendent in charge of administration who was in charge of hiring, what I want you to do is I want you to hire some black brakemen. He said, okay, boss, we'll do that. So then he had to send all the applications that he had approved and we were ready to hire to me. You know, so I could look at them and I, the first 30, there were no black brakemen. So I said to him, um, what, what's the matter here? Uh, he said, well, there are no qualified ones. I said, no, I, I know there must be, so try harder. So the next 30, <laughs> there's, there's 30 more white people. And I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We won't hire one white brakeman until we hire a black white brakeman. And then we'll go one for one for one. So if we're going to have any more employees hired on this railroad, it's going to be 50-50. And that broke it. And then... How did the people in the field react? I'm sure they didn't like it. Yeah, I, I'm sure you never, I, you never got any. No, I'm sure it was tough for those first guys. But yeah. my man, these were jobs made in heaven for these people. Right, right. Um, that put them in the middle class. Sure, good benefits. Yeah. What uh, about in engineering and mechanical? Did you do something similar there? Uh, yeah, but I'll tell you one thing. In, in the engineering department, we had we promoted a. Uh, a a black fellow to a uh, management roadmaster's position. First time ever, probably on the whole railroad, maybe the whole system. And the guy was great. And we always had this management meeting around Christmas time where we took spouses and we got everybody together. And we had it, it's a little, little club, it was right across from the condo where Ann and I live. It was a, a private though, swimming club, but it had a nice banquet facility. And so we, we, we signed that thing up and it's like two days before the meeting and I get a call from the division engineer. And they say to me, uh, you know, it's, they do not allow black people in this club. So I'm just going to tell this guy he can't come. <laughs> and they said, what? <laughs> so we moved the meeting. We moved it to uh, Admiral Benbow. They had a they had a banquet facility, a hotel, and uh, we moved it there. And they were okay with that. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I'm just gonna tell him he can't come. Oh. Jeez. Well, it's a different world. Yeah, it is. But it went. Did that spread across the system gradually? Sure. sure. 1991. Um, the managing the total quality initiative. I think that goes hand in hand with what you were saying about streamlining the workforce and so forth. But um, can you comment more about the, the things you did? Yeah, well, we spent billions of dollars uh, starting the double track, buying locomotives, building new terminals. We had two really fortunate things happen. Uh, UPS, which at that time, I guess, was our, probably our largest customer, 
built this Chicago area consolidation hub. They, they bought an old General Motors damping plant. That building was so big, and it was right next to our main line. That building was so big, if you laid it on its, if you put it up and tipped the thing up, it would be taller than the Sears Tower. They could park 1,200 trucks at their docks at one time. Big trucks, not little trucks. And we built a yard right next to it. And they didn't even have to drive those trucks out on, the, on a public road to come back and forth between our railroad. And that's when we started these intermodal trains, especially for UPS that would get from Chicago to uh, LA in about 48 hours. This is Willow Springs. Yeah. Okay. And then we also, uh, the Pro family bought a whole bunch of property up north of Fort Worth and we ended up putting a rail yard out at Alliance and that became a big hub for us too. So we had great hubs in both Houston and Chicago. And UPS, our service was so good that uh, their, their crunch time was the day after Thanksgiving to Christmas Eve. And we always handled about 35,000 of their 50, 50, 50 foot trailers during that period of time. One year we did it without one single failure. So we moved 55 billion packages without one single failure. And then we go ask them for a rate increase and they beat us up and down. Yeah. <laughs> they were the most thankless people. Yeah. And eventually when we tried to merge with uh, the CN, they, they were all over shooting that down. Uh, but anyway, I mean, we, we got to the point where we were as good as trucks. And once we got to the point, the business started to grow and it, it grew, exp grew exponentially. And, and I had some statistics here about Hunt. Um, no, oh, yeah, fourteen thousand three hundred units yeah. in nineteen ninety to one hundred twenty-five thousand in nineteen ninety-three. Yeah. And today, I know it's probably half a million. Um, so anyway, we 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 started making good money. We um, we fixed up the railroad. We uh, we, we took Haverty's uh, advice and painted all our locomotives in these war bonnet collars, color, and and we were. Uh, we were running a great railroad and people were proud of it. But the problem was we just weren't big enough in the long run to survive and to get to the next step because the railroading, it's, it's a network business. Right. And the bigger your network, the more valuable you are to your customers, which is why ultimately I wanted to do a transcontinental merger, which I never got to do. Um, but but you talked about it with some of the Eastern carriers. Yeah, I did. I actually had an idea I was going to buy Conrail at one time. I went back to see the guy running that place. I don't remember his name now, but he he, he, he rode a Harley Davidson motorcycle. Dave LeVan. There you go. Yeah. And he would have nothing to do with it. And thank God he, he would have nothing to do with it because that would have been a major calamity. He's running the uh, Harley Davidson dealership in Gettysburg, PA. Is he? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's probably the dream of his life. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. The. Uh, yeah, and I also, there was a time I wanted to merge with, with uh, Norfolk Southern. That would have been perfect. 